There's a time for everything under the sun. There's a time to laugh and a time to cry. There's a time to work and a time to rest. There's a time to live and there's time to die. Now, as a Christian, there is a time for you to read the word and build your understanding and knowledge of the things of God and the ways of God. There's a time to pray and a time to serve. But what I'd like to talk to you about is when it's time to fight. Because there will come a day, there will come a season when you will have to fight. And this fight could be for your family, it could be a fight for your health, or a fight to be set free from sin. Whatever it is, sooner or later you will find yourself in the middle of a fight. Now, when problems arise, when battles are before us, when we experience spiritual warfare, the Word of God has to be a source of constant reassurance to us. It must be that which ignites the fire in our faith. It must kickstart your hope and belief so that regardless of what you're facing, despite the size of the enemy, despite whatever is taking place in our lives, we have a divine and heavenly insurance policy which is the Word of God. We're backed by angelic forces that come to our aid when we shout the name of Jesus in desperate need of help. We have security in our Father's faithfulness. He has never lost a battle. He has never been defeated, nor can He ever be defeated. But as His children, we should always be prepared. We should always be ready. Ephesians 6 verse 13 says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. I would like to take a moment to deconstruct this verse and what it means to us as children of God. The Bible says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. The first thing to notice is that this is an instruction we're told to take up the whole armor of God. It's not a question of whether you can or cannot take this up. No, it's clear instruction. This is something you need to do. The second thing is, you only need armor if you are in a war. You only need armor in battle. You only need armor when there is an opposing force coming against you. And when the Bible says the whole armor, this says to me that there are multiple parts that need to be taken up. Anything than the whole armor would leave you vulnerable. So it's important we follow this instruction, not only take up parts of the armor, but the whole armor of God. Now, the second part of this verse says that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. This statement has a level of certainty to it. You need to take up the whole armor of God so that you can withstand in the evil day. Now, in this part of the verse, I get the impression that the Bible is warning us. The Bible is warning us that there will be an evil day, a day when we'll have to fight the forces of evil. And the forces of evil can attack in many forms. However, if we are wearing the whole armor of God, then we will be able to withstand anything the devil aims in our direction. Now that we have a better understanding of this verse, I want to encourage you and rally you up. Yes, you are in a war. If you are a true disciple of Christ, you will be at war. You will be at war against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, in these few moments, I want to remind you that the word is central to your defense stance, as well as your offensive stance as a Christian. So when you face the evil day, remember 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, but the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. When you face the evil day, Remember Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. 
When you face that evil day, Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So be encouraged, child of God. Do not fear when evil comes against you. The Lord is with you, and the promises of God should give you the confidence to be bold in the face of evil. Saints of God, abide in the presence of the Lord always. Don't dabble and gamble with your life or your eternal destiny. The devil is out there, so we need to remain in Christ. We need to always be in Christ and be found to be obeying his word. Now let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your word says you are the Alpha and the Omega, the author and the finisher, and almighty God. You hold time in your hands. You hold the keys to life and death in your hands. And you certainly, most certainly, hold my life in your hands. I praise you, Lord Jesus, the precious Lamb of God. I pray in agreement with everyone listening as we ask for divine intervention. Father, intervene in our affairs and fight our battles. Remove the enemy before us, Lord. Break the chains that bind us, Father. I pray that we will experience your supernatural power in our lives, Lord Jesus. Help us to stand strong against the forces of darkness. Help us to stand firm in faith against every evil influence that targets our family. Help us to stand and believe your word, which tells us that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Father, I speak and declare your word in Psalm 91, verses 7 through 11. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. I come against any evil forces that may try to attack my life in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior. I come against all principalities of evil that try to disrupt the peace which you have given me. I rebuke the forces of darkness that come to try and rob me of my joy and my strength. And I declare that I have victory through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. May the Holy Spirit empower me always. May the Holy Spirit give me the strength and boldness to withstand anything the enemy throws in my direction. I trust in you, Lord Jesus because you will cause my enemies, those who rise against me, to be defeated. As your word says, they will come out against me one way and flee before me seven ways. And that is not because I'm strong, but it is because you, Lord Jesus, are my shield and refuge. You are my protector. Lord, your word tells me in James 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I gladly submit to you, Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit would strengthen me to fight and never give in to the enemy. Stand with me, Holy Spirit, and let the joy of the Lord be my strength. Lord Jesus, through the power of your precious name and blood, I agree with your word in Isaiah 41 verse 10 that says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold your righteous right hand. 
I will praise you in advance for giving me the victory, King Jesus. Be glorified forevermore. I thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Ephesians 1 verse 13, the Bible tells us one of the most extraordinary things. And I believe this is something that we all need to know and cherish. The Bible says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. When we heard the message of truth, the message of truth being the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that tells us that Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins and then rose again from the dead, when we heard this message of truth, the gospel of salvation, then when we believed this message, we were marked in Christ with a seal, and that seal is the Holy Spirit. I find it incredible that the Bible tells us this. When you believe in Jesus Christ, the Lord can identify you as His own by the seal that is upon your life, the Holy Spirit. And so, for anyone who struggles with knowing their identity, let me tell you that your identity is in Jesus Christ because He has branded you, He has marked you, and sealed you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit authenticates the believer from the unbeliever. This is why the Bible tells us that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, what happens when the Holy Spirit enters the life of a person? What are the signs to look for when you want to identify if the Holy Spirit is in your life? Well, to begin with, the Holy Spirit is our helper. The Amplified Translation for John chapter 16, verse 7 says, But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, Comforter, Advocate, Intercessor, Counselor, Strengthener, Standby, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him, the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close fellowship with you. When you are feeling powerless, the Holy Spirit will help you. When you are low and feeling tired, the Holy Spirit will help you. When you feel too weak to pray, the Holy Spirit will help you. When you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you will find Him to be a helper, just as the Bible says. It doesn't mean that life will be easy, and it certainly doesn't mean that your Christian life will be easy. But it does mean that in those difficult and tough moments, you have divine help. You have help from above. You have the Holy Spirit. Another sign that the Holy Spirit is in your life is that it beckons you to do God's will. He encourages you to do the will of the Lord. In the book of Acts, there is an astonishing passage of Scripture that demonstrates just how the Holy Spirit can work in our lives. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 31 says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Notice that in verse 29 the Bible says, And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. The Holy Spirit led Philip to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ to this Ethiopian eunuch. Acts 8 verse 35 to 39 of the Bible says, then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. 
The Holy Spirit led Philip to minister about the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone who was ready to be saved. And you and I can be. In fact, we should seek to be led by the Holy Spirit in this same way. The Holy Spirit can lead you to pray for a family member or a friend without them ever having told you that they are going through something. The Holy Spirit can lead you to pick up the phone and offer someone a word of encouragement when they are in a dark place. And so we need to be sensitive to His voice. Another sign that the Holy Spirit has entered your life can be found in Romans 15 verse 13. The Bible reads, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The power of the Holy Spirit helps us to have hope. In this world, there are so many things that can leave you discouraged. So many things come in life and they threaten to kill your joy. However, the power of the Holy Spirit will be our source of hope. Furthermore, when the Holy Spirit enters your life, He will convict you of sin. John 16, verse 7 to 8 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When the Holy Spirit is in your life, the sin that you used to enjoy will become painful to take pleasure in because the Holy Spirit will convict your heart. He will remind you of the price that Jesus Christ paid for you on the cross. The Holy Spirit will convict you to live a life that is pure and pleasing to the Lord, and He will certainly convict you to forsake the sin in your life. Walk in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Bear the fruit of the Spirit and live in the Spirit. Your entire life as a believer is determined, influenced, guided by the Holy Spirit. And so going back to my initial point that the Holy Spirit, not the pastor or the preacher, the Holy Spirit convicts you to change your life and turn away from sin. And that's only the beginning. So to the one who asks, how will I walk in wisdom and not fall back into my old ways, the Holy Spirit will help you do this. How can I remove this desire of sin? The Holy Spirit will help you walk in the Spirit and He will give you the strength to fight those tempting desires of the flesh. How do I live with boldness as a fearless Christian in these evil days? The Holy Spirit will give you power and authority. He will be your helper. It's the Holy Spirit who will help you to understand and discover God's will for your life. The key for us is willingness. Are you willing to be absorbed, to be filled by the Holy Spirit? Will you let Him walk in you and through you